And today we're going to talk about something really simple, and that's don't criticize. Don't be so critical. I've got a dog, two of them. One of them is really critical, Daisy, my standard poodle. Uh, I've mentioned to you for weeks and weeks, she does not a biter. She's a judger. She looks right down her long beak, and she just criticizes. I can just tell what she's thinking. She's always judging. I have another little dog. He's a mutt. His name's Baxter. We call him Baxter County. And... Um, not sure what he is. We know who his mom is. Not 100% sure who the dad is. We adopted him. And, um, you know, he's a great little dog most of the time. But I was in my office yesterday and I'm sitting there and I'm reading my notes and watching some golf. And Baxter comes around the corner into my office, this little dog, 12 pounds or so, and looks at me in the eyes and stops and hunches over and does a doggy doo-doo right in front of me, making eye contact with me the entire time. And then after he was done, he kicked the dirt like that and then walked back out of my office. Well, I was angry. That was unacceptable behavior. And we had a problem for Joy to clean up. No, I'm just kidding with you. That's not the way it always works in my house. Um, I saw behavior. It, 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 it angered me. There had to be no excuse for it. I, I felt myself wanting to have some strong words with little Baxter County. And so I asked my wife, I said, Joy, did you do anything to Baxter that would have made him act out in some way like he did? Well, no, of course not. And I said, what's wrong with Baxter? I'm trying to think, you know, did something happen? Was Daisy mean to him? Why did he behave the way he did? I couldn't come up with any explanation. And so Baxter and I had a conversation about his behavior and how his behavior should change in the future. Now, I don't know if Baxter is going to listen or if he's going to change his behavior, but have you ever looked at somebody and you've been so confused by their behavior, so concerned about what they've done that you look at them and you're like, I don't know any reason why they would have done that. And so you just decide to pass judgment. You decide to be critical. You may, may have heard the Bible say, don't be judgy. Judge not lest you be judged. And the Bible, in fact, does say that. But the Bible doesn't talk about not knowing the difference between right and wrong, not having firm convictions over what's sin and what's acceptable behavior. But the Bible does talk about, in fact, Jesus himself talks about that we are not supposed to be judgy. Now, the word judgy is very easily understood when translated by the context as being critical. Don't be critical. Stop being critical. Are there any critical people in here? Don't raise your hands. First service, I asked that question. People were like, and then people were pointing at their wives and their husbands. It was ugly. I mean, we about had to stop and have prayer right, right there. Do you ever feel yourself becoming critical? Just sliding toward that, just, you know, just, I just want to see the flaws. I just want to point out the flaws. Well, well, Jesus lived in a world where the religious people of his day were really critical and they wanted to see the flaws and point out the flaws and they wanted you to live and be aware of your flaws. And so right after Jesus gave a sermon called the Sermon on the Mount, where he taught about the kingdom of God and how we relate to each other, he goes into this really simple parable where he says, don't judge or you're going to be judged. Let me read it to you and you can see for yourself. Don't judge, now remember the word judge here is criticize, or you too will be criticized. For in the same way you criticize others, you will be criticized. And with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Now, if you're tracking with me already, and I hope you are, what Jesus is saying is that we have to be careful about having a critical spirit toward other people that we need to make sure that we are aware that we have issues we have to deal with. He says our issues are a plank and other people's issues are a speck. But he's assuming that we see our issues as being a speck if we even acknowledge that they're there and other people's issues as being a huge plank. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye you hypocrite, first take the plank out of your eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brothers. So why is Jesus talking about criticism? Why is it important to him? Now, I want you to track with me here. I want you to pay attention to this principle. This will be the principle that helps you understand the rest of what we talk about this morning. Are you ready? 
Oh my goodness. Are you ready for the principle, the key that's going to unlock the rest of the morning together? You guys have to help me over here, please. Thank you very much. All right. We have some hyper religious, holy rolling people on this side of the stage, not you guys, me over here for uh, illustration purposes, who are really judgy and who want to point out the flaws in everybody. Again, not you guys, me on the stage over here on this side. And Jesus says, stop doing that. You're an obstacle by constantly pointing out the things you see in everybody else that have to change. And then on this side over here, you have people who don't know Jesus at all and who are the results of the criticism being heaved over the walls of the church where they nitpick and judge and drive away. And Jesus said, the ground is level here at the foot of the cross. So you religious holy rollers come here to humility and meet people with understanding so that you who don't know Jesus can come here and meet at the cross and find out that the gospel can change your life. But Jesus says, your criticism is an obstacle and you're not working with me, you're working against me. Now, Jesus isn't just talking about you being critical of the world in general. You watch the news and you're like, ah, oh, this world's going to you know where. And you're like, oh, well, you know, I get it. The Bible says that the world's probably not going to get any better until Jesus comes again. So you can develop a critical disposition toward everything. You can allow that to impact your personal relationships. And I want you to think in concentric circles. Perhaps you allow it to make you critical and judgy to the people who you see coincidentally throughout your day, where they may look a little different than you. They may act a little different. They may be dressed a little differently. And so you immediately judge them, put them in a box and criticize. Perhaps it's people who wait on you or serve you in Starbucks, restaurants, the dry cleaners, and your critical spirit and attitude is just sort of shifted over where you point out the flaws and you're entitled and demanding. And it doesn't stop there because then it moves to relationships in the family. Does anyone have a family member? Perhaps are you that family member who is so critical of the rest of your family that nobody wants to see them or you coming? That your favorite thing to do or theirs is to have somebody else for lunch, talking about all the flaws and all the things that need to change. What about a marriage? How many marriages have you seen? Perhaps you're in one where one of the spouses is really critical of the other, pointing out the flaws, nitpicking, judging everything, driving the other person away. Even more tragically, what about a parent who's critical to a child? The words spoken to a child in constant criticism by a mother shape oftentimes the feeling of self-worth and even the personality of the child that hears the criticism all the time. I can't do anything right. I'm never gonna measure up. A father who's critical to his children shapes the child's view of God and they believe that God himself is critical and God says, I'm not critical of you. I'm for you. I want to encourage you. I want to change your life. So you see, when Jesus is reminding us that we can be working against him and not for him with our critical, entitled, self-righteous, judgmental spirit, it makes sense why he sticks it right there in the middle of Matthew 7, which has so much important teaching. But there's an illustration from Luke that I want to read to you. Two men went up to the temple to pray. Two went up because two times a day you go up to the temple. Back in Jesus' day, you went up at 9 a.m. and you prayed if you wanted to. Optional services. There was a sacrifice offered at 9 and 3 by the priest. Uh, offer a sacrifice of atonement, which paid for the penalty of sins symbolically. And you could go up and you could pray, 9 a.m., 3 p.m. The 3 p.m. service was better attended. Um, interestingly enough, usually our later service is better attended than our first service. Maybe it's biblical. I don't know. But there were two times to go up. One, a Pharisee who went up to pray. The other, a tax collector. Now, everyone who heard this would have gasped because, as you know, tax collectors weren't really allowed in the temple. 
The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, I thank God that I am not like other people. Now picture this. A Pharisee goes over by himself and prays. Let's just say we're having a prayer service or maybe even just a time of prayer. And one of you stands up and you scoot off over by yourself because you don't want to be seen by the other people in your section. And you look up to heaven and you hold your hands out, which is customary of the way people prayed back in Jesus' day. The Old Testament instructs that one of the ways you can pray is with your face toward heaven, which symbolizes a clean heart before God, with arms outstretched, which symbolizes your offering to God what you have and receiving to God what he's offering you. But this person scoots over in your section and begins to pray, thank you, God, that I am not like all the other riffraff in my section, that I am not an adulterer, I'm not a liar, I'm not a gossiper, I'm not a swindler, I wasn't late to church, I'm just kidding with you. <laughs> I, that's what... I mean, the most obnoxious person in the world would do, right? Just calling people out for their perceived sin. And everybody kind of steps away and he says, wait a second, I'm the holy one. I speak for God here. And Jesus is pointing this person out saying, how in the world do you say you speak for God when you're pointing out the flaws in everybody? And then you have, conversely, a tax collector who stood at a distance and wouldn't look up to heaven, not even trying to play like his heart was right between himself and the Lord. He beat his breasts, which was symbolic. Thankfully, we don't do that in our prayer times. Of remorse, of unworthiness, not trying to play, not trying to look like something he wasn't not trying to blend into a Christian subculture so that nobody, you know, judged him, just being himself, letting it all hang out, pouring his heart out to God. And he says, God, have mercy on me, I'm a sinner. Jesus said, I tell you, this man rather than the other went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled and all those who are humbled will be exalted. I look at these two people. One person who thought he owned the church. One person who thought he set the standard of spirituality. One person who measured you by their expectations and their interpretation of scripture and stood apart in judgment and pointed out our flaws. And then you have the other. Now, I confess, I don't remember what it's like to come to church for the first time because I was born in church, not literally born in church. That'd be weird. But I was born uh, and first thing I did, I think, is went to church when I was negative nine months. Um, I went to church from the time I was conceived. My mom had me in church when I was growing up. My dad said, you're in my household. You go to church. If you don't go to church, you move out, find someplace else to live. And that's how strong my dad felt about it. And I didn't want to find any place to live that I could afford, so I went to church. That's just the way it was. I've not had a time in my life where I have not been in church, but I have many, 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 many friends who talk to me about how much courage it takes even to show up at a place like this, to wonder what they're gonna experience, to wonder who they're gonna experience, to wonder what it's gonna feel like if they're gonna have people like this Pharisee standing up, pointing out the flaws of others. And I see one person with such hatred and contempt and self-righteousness and the other with such courage to be able to do what this guy did. And so who do you think Jesus sided with? Jesus sided with the tax collector and everybody in the crowd would have gasped because the one who said he was a super Christian wasn't even a Christian at all. But the one who somebody said didn't really fit and had their fingers pointing at him, Jesus said he gets it. He goes home justified. This guy, uh-uh. He goes home self-righteous. Well, it tells me three things very quickly. One, if we find ourselves to be hypercritical, very critical, with a critical spirit and a critical nature, it means that we have a very faulty view of God. In fact, it means that we think we are God. It means that when I criticize you, 
I know your motive. I know your heart. I know your background. There are no facts that I don't have. There is nothing that I don't understand. So I can pass judgment on you and I can put you in a category that makes me comfortable and makes me feel better than you. Disgusting. And Jesus said it happens all the time. When we find ourselves hyper critical, we drive the people in our lives away from us. And nobody believes that we are all that and a bag of chips except ourselves sometimes. And the problem is we don't realize that we're alone until it's too late. And then we don't realize that we've been working against the gospel and against the Lord until it's too late. I went on a search this week for reasons that people may be hypercritical. And there are a lot of different reasons. Some there's a self-image issue where a person may feel like they're you're not worth a whole lot and so they like to bring other people down to make themselves feel better. There are some psychological suggestions of control where we like to control the people around us. So if we criticize the people around us, it kind of gives us a way to sort of compartmentalize and label and kind of have everything in a nice, neat little box. For some, it's just sort of a mean streak, an anger streak where we just sort of lash out and it's the way we fight. And there are a few, I don't know if they're called narcissists or if they're called, I don't know, who just really think that they're, they set the standard, that they know everything and that everyone should measure up to what they believe and what they think. And if they don't, well, certainly they should receive criticism and should be thankful to get it. And Jesus is like, look, you can never meet here at the foot of the cross if you're too busy criticizing every behavior in the people of your world around you. You have a faulty view of God because you've tried to play God. Number two, you have a faulty view of others. Interesting that Jesus says in Matthew 7 that what you give, you get. In Judges 1, there's a little illustration of this, and I think it's hilarious, not because it's comfortable or really that funny, it's just ironic, where the children of Israel, or one of the tribes actually, was chasing down two warring peoples, and they were battling in Judges chapter 1, and they finally caught up with this king. He was kind of a dirtbag king, and uh, this dirtbag king was captured, and when they captured him, they cut off his thumbs and his big toes, and I thought, well, that is a little bit harsh, and I guess the reason they did that was so that you really didn't have a lot of physical mobility, and you were pretty dependent. Um, I have both my big toes and both my thumbs, and so I don't know how hard it would be not to, but I'm guessing without them it would be really tough. And, and so right here at the bottom of this passage, you see this king who wasn't a Jew, and for our purposes, Christians. He said, man, isn't this ironic? The way I treated other people, well, that's the way I'm now being treated. He said, 70 kings with their thumbs and big toes cut off have picked up scraps under my table. I have done this to 70 people. And now look what God has done to me. We have a faulty view of others if we think we can criticize them without having God taking their side and coming back with a critical spirit toward us and our self-righteousness. Jesus cares that much. Well, number three, not only do we have a faulty view of God and a faulty view of others, but it means that we have a faulty view of ourselves. Now, this is my favorite. The Bible says, you have a plank, they have a speck. You get it? A speck of sard a sawdust, sawdust, a speck of sawdust, a speck, a speck, and a two by four. And the Bible says, you got the two by four in your eyes. If your two by four is in your eyes, what can you see? Nothing, right? The Bible says, take the plank out of your eye before you even look at the speck in somebody else's eye. And I say, but Jesus, you're wrong. They're the ones with the plank. Don't you see how annoying their behavior is? I pooped in my office. I mean, you know I me, mean, good gracious. I'm judging behavior. I see what I see. And there's no excuse for it. And Jesus said, wait a second, no. If you view yourself correctly, all of a sudden in humility, you realize how much you have to be forgiven for. How many issues we have in our own life and our relationships toward other people. It's not hard for us to acknowledge the fact that we have this plank. 
We like to look at our sins as omissions or accidents, oversights, and other people's as huge infractions and willful defiance. And Jesus said, listen, deal with your stuff yourself and let the weight of it land on you. And then with compassion and humility, you look at the people around you and you choose to point out the best, not the worst. I think everybody has a criticism to encouragement ratio. And there are times, as illustrated in Matthew chapter seven, where Jesus said, go and take the plank out of your own eye, comma, and then go to your brother and win him over. And then through influence and encouragement, perhaps he will see the speck so that his life with Christ might be more fulfilled and complete. But I think there has to be a ratio of encouragement to criticism. Have you observed the look in a child's face when they're criticized over and over and over by a parent? What if the encouragement to criticism ratio is 20 to one? then how differently could that well-placed, heartfelt parental criticism or critique be in your marriage relationship? What if it's, and I'm just picking this out of the air, 20 to one, where I encourage my wife 20 times. And then the one time that maybe there's something that's constructive that I need to point out that maybe might make her relationship better with the Lord in humility and gentleness, I do it. How different does it land with my friends, with my employees, with the people I bump into? You and I, we need help because we're desperately sinful and desperately critical. And we're becoming more and more obnoxious and alienated from what Jesus wants to get done. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to sing a few songs. And then after that, Pastor Dan's going to come and he's going to talk to you about the anecdote for criticism. And that is encouragement. And it doesn't have to come naturally to you for you to be an encourager. And it does not have to be part of your personality for you to be an encourager. If it is something you're willing to be intentional about and spirit led, you can find yourself living with this 20 to 1. 100 to 1, 10 to 1, you pick your ratio quotient where with relentless, ruthless humility, you're eliminating the things in your own life that need to go and meeting people where they are so that both of you can arrive at the safe ground at the foot of the cross. So we're going to pray. We're going to sing. And then we're going to apply. Father, thank you so much for the time. All right, so we're going to talk about um, how to speak those words of encouragement. But let me set it up like this. Most of us, most of the people that you're around, um, feel more like the tax collector than they do the Pharisee. They have either had words spoken over them, to them, lies in their head, circumstances that betray them and they think of themselves as best average and many think of themselves as worth less. Families are blowing up, marriages, their dysfunction. It is not hard to remind us what kind of culture we live in right now. You know, when the words, the hardest words that are said are our words said to ourselves, and there's many that sometimes are in our head and sometimes I call them in our heart. That means they've settled deep within that. And just to validate that, you guys know at CityServe, we connect with everybody from Ankeny Police has literally told us this, Des Moines, the, the Sheriff's Department across the street, fire departments, superintendents, principals, teachers, I hear the same thing. We do more speaking life and truth and hope and counsel like never before. So when Rick talks about words, the encouragement, they're always important, but now even more so. So what does the Bible say about that? I'm glad you asked. Let's check out Hebrews. 
The Bible is not just the Bible. It literally is, in my opinion, it is the book of life. It has all the solutions in there. So Hebrews 10, 24 says this, and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together because doing this thing is very important as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. Hebrews 3, 13 says this, but encourage one another when you feel like it. Daily, very good. Uh, encourage one another if you're an extrovert. Is that what it says? No, daily? Imagine what would happen if we really thought daily of speaking words into people's lives. So daily, as long as it's called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Again, those lies in our head, the circumstances that go on. Now, let me just tell you that um, Rick was the smart one when we were growing up in school. He's a year older than I am, even though I think he's five years older. I'm just kidding, not really, but Rick does, he's smart. Me, um, I had asked my dad when I had a couple of electives in high school, right? Some of us did our courses and you get a couple of electives and it gave me two actually really good thoughts. One was really good, one was sort of good until today I realized it was really good. First one was typing. Who knew we were gonna have to type everything in the world from our phones to our you know, keyboards, right? And the second thing he told me to take was I thought was pretty dumb. It's a big fancy word, so be prepared. It's called etymology the study of words, how they come together, what's their derivative, how, where they start from. And so, you know, the Bible, as I said before, is such a great tool. It's the word encourage is from the French. Are you impressed yet? Okay, I want you to be. E-N means put in and courage means courage or heart. So when the Bible says, but encourage one another daily, you're literally putting courage into people. Is that important in our culture in our day and time? Just a little bit. And of course, back in the Hebrew time, which is close to Jesus' time there, they had the same situations going on. A lot of lies, a lot of hurt, a lot of pain. So the words we learn to speak into people make so much difference. Sometimes we don't think they do, but scripture has told us in the etymology that you now know says that we put courage courage into people, the ability to encourage them to keep on, to press on, to cast out the lies. The best way to cast out the lies in our head is to replace them with truth. Now, people ask me all the time, hey, Dan, what's the quickest way I can change my marriage, my parenting with my kids, um, my team, my business? The quickest way is to look and observe and validate what you see. You say, well, I can do that. Well, then do it. It's simple. Now, here's what you can do. You can't, you can't fabricate stuff, right? Superficiality. If you give a superficial comment, people are like, no, it's not from you. Or, you know, I, I don't talk about nice dress because I don't wear dresses. I don't talk about shoes because shoes aren't that big of a deal to me. But watching and observing people, just factual statements make such a huge impact. You say, Dan, that's easy for you. You're a pastor. No, it's not. You know why? Because God wired me with a unique gift to be a Pharisee. So I am task over people. Rick says this great phrase all the time. People are either on the way or in the way. I see them as in the way, in my natural state, in my default state. If I'm not careful, I'm not a nice guy. Lori, who is the nicest lady that I know of, calls me the dream killer when we take a drive and we're thinking and dreaming, right? And dreaming doesn't have parameters. But guess what I like? Parameters. I start saying about the money it's gonna cost, the research we gotta do, the certifications gotta happen, blah, blah, blah. I, in my default mode, I'm a dream killer. And I'm a Pharisee. I judge the way you do things. That's my natural bent. I'm good at administration, so I know it's more efficient, more practical, most, more productive. What you do stinks. You say, Dan, you're not very nice. I know. That's honestly why I need Jesus in my life. It's why every day, as Matthew 22 says, I've got to take up, I've got to deny myself, my natural state, my default state. I've got to take up my cross. And I got to follow him because the things that go on here that sometimes you don't see, it ain't pretty. 
And the Spirit starts to renew my mind because I don't want to be what Rick just got through preaching. And if I'm not careful, I can absolutely be that way. And I don't want it. Second thing you might be saying, but Dan, you don't understand I'm an introvert. Well, guess what? So is the majority of the population. Now you know there's no excuse. Majority of the population are introverts, personality-wise. You're not wired that way. I'm not wired that way. Here's a secret. You ready for a secret? You can't tell anybody. Online, you get a promise right now. Across your, yeah. I'm serious. This is very, it's going to blow your socks off. You ready? Pastor Rick and I are introverts. It's true. Our people meter goes below zero. We're done with church and talking with people. We don't jump back into people. We're done. We got to go do our thing that we do, our habit, our hobby that fuels us back up. We're not introverts. Well, then you next question is, well, how come you look like it? How come I look like it? Because we're not churchgoers. We're followers of Jesus. And how I'm wired is not an excuse to stay where I'm at. This man predicted his death, burial, and resurrection and pulled it off. His name is Jesus. And whatever he says, I do, we do. And how I'm naturally wired is not an excuse to say, well, no. Rick, Pastor Rick preached a while back that Jesus always went first. To Nicodemus, he went first. To the woman at the well, he went first. The woman caught in adultery, he went first. He made that connection verbally. We risk a little bit. I understand that. But the Pharisees said to Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? And I know most of you in here know it. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And period, right? Nope. And to love neighbor. And Rick's already defined neighbor, right? Neighbor is all of us. So why do we do what we do even though we're wired this way? Because I want to be like Jesus. I'm a follower. We are followers of Jesus. So how does it flesh itself out? Well, let's look at a couple of uh, practical real life examples. So how to be an encourager. First, I know this seems churchy, but I do have to do it every day. Ask God to help you see the value in people. Ask him every day. If I don't do this in my mind, I go back to my default mode, that guy that you're not really happy with. I'm not pretty. I'm the dream killer if I'm not careful. So I do ask God to Renew my mind, change my mindset to see and observe people. The second thing is just to reflect on the previous week. Simple. Just reflect. And starting with concentric circles, reflect on what your spouse did, those closest to me. What my kids did, coworkers did. Who did God put and cross my path this week? That maybe I had a comment or I could have, but it just starts to retrain your mind. And when you do this enough to reflect on the past week, it starts to be a normal occurrence. You start to have renewed eyes that see things in people. Hey, what you said today at the meeting, man, that was insightful. We needed to hear that. If I could stay up here doing executive coaching and team coaching with business, you'd be blown away at how many thoughts are in people's lives. Whatever their status, whatever their org chart or however long they've been around, it blows me away to know that the enemy is on the prowl. But I'm telling you, when you start to, 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 to differentiate a different habit, you've got to start with reflecting and thinking ahead. And then here's a crazy one, but put it on the calendar. Anything important goes on your calendar. You have never said, oh my gosh, we're going to Mexico next week. How'd that happen? Oh my goodness, we're going to the Florida. We're going to the mountains, right? You put that in your calendar. You're thinking about it. What you're going to do, you're, it's the light in the tunnel, right? And anything important goes on a calendar. And here's another little secret. You can't tell anybody. You ready? I'm, I'm, I don't know what it is today, Pastor Rick. I got all kind of little confessions. Um, Pastor Rick, I think, you know, Jared, we do the same thing. We think of things, we observe things, and because there's too many things in my little brain, I literally have to start to write those things down. I put them on a counter, I put a reminder in there. And then the simple thing is just start doing it. Just, I don't know what's going on with those lights, but <laughs> sometimes I use the force, sometimes the force just comes out of me, you know, Star Wars thing, and just see, there you go, just like that. Um, but you start and you do the simplest thing. You watch and affirm what you see in others. It's just simple. What are they doing well? Naturally, skill and ability. 
And maybe it's something like, you know what? They're just consistent, man. They show up and work. They're, they're the early person, the late person. I, honestly, I like clean. I'm sort of that way, Pastor. I, I love those who empty our trash and clean our stuff. Like it means a lot to me. But do I verbalize something like that? Just start. And when you start doing the simplest thing, of course, start with concentric circles. Your wife, kids, friends, neighbors, just start thinking through that. Just start. Is it risky? Of course it is. Is it courageous? Yes. Do people need it now more than ever? What do you think? So last verse, 1 Thessalonians says this, and we're going to replace the word encourage with your etymology word. Are you ready? Therefore, put courage into one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. Guys, this is something we have to do. We're supposed to be known for it. The words that come out of our mouth. I can be the Pharisee. Dan is good at that. It comes natural. Or led by the Holy Spirit. I so desperately want to be like Jesus and put courage into you to press on doing what God has created you to do, the mission he has you on, and so that we all wind up on home plate, heaven together. Pastor Rick, I think we want to take some time and pray over our friends. Before we do that, though, I think I need to continue your confessions to people. <laughs> This morning, and I came into church, um, Pastor Dan meets with a group of people on early eight o'clock in the morning, 8.30, to pray for you guys, to pray for me as I preach. And I uh, walked in just to say hi to him, to check in on him. And the first thing Pastor Dan did is he made fun of my shirt. Can you believe that? He criticized my shirt. He called it show love, right? He called it hot salmon, not hot pink. And um, I think he should confess that and be more encouraging. So I just wanted to share that. Sure. I wanted to it's share true. that with our friends. So as Pastor Dan mentioned, it doesn't come naturally to many of us to be encouragers. Criticism comes naturally. And you probably have seen the results in your own relationships, the way your kids look at you, the, the way that even if an adult kid or grandchild, uh, something goes on in their life, you're the last person they want to tell. People who hide things from you because they know that judgment or criticism is coming. Just the way you view the world, you find fewer people want to have conversations with you because there's just so much that spews out that is alienating. Um, we need help. And I want us to be strong men and women of God with soft hearts. And um, this is the way that I know how to do that. First of all, I think we confess the attitude of, of being critical. And I don't think we just confess it to God. I think that's where it starts. But I think, and I'm suggesting this to you, and you do what you want it's between you and the Lord, you confess to the people who you've wronged in this way. That's good. I think that if you've been critical towards your children, I think you should own it and apologize for it and ask forgiveness for it and let them know that you want to live a different way. If you've been critical toward your husband or towards your wife, I feel like that the right thing to do before the Lord is to own it and to apologize to the Lord, but also to your husband or your wife for your critical spirit and tell them you don't want to be that way anymore and work itself out until you find that God's done the difficult work in you, but the worthwhile work of giving us soft hearts as we're becoming strong men and women of God, this is one of the things that was so important to Jesus because without it, it's impossible for us to meet at the level ground at the foot of the cross. And that's where we need to live. And it's hard. It's hard for me. It's hard for Pastor Dan. I know it's hard for many of you, but just because it's hard doesn't mean it's not worth it. So I want to pray for you. And I'm going to start off by praying that if you have a critical spirit, that God would reveal to us um, this spirit, that we would confess it to the Lord and we would resolve in our hearts to be able to confess it to those we've wronged and make it right. And then Pastor Dan's going to pray for you and for me to become encouragers. And Pastor Dan is one of the best encouragers that I know. And he's going to ask God to give us through the sensitivity to his Holy Spirit, the motivation and desire and opportunity to genuinely encourage the people in our lives and nudge them uh, toward godliness. So let's pray together as we close our time. Father, thank you for my friends. And I pray for those like me, like Pastor Dan, who struggles sometimes with a critical spirit. 
who wound those closest to us unknowingly, perhaps even sometimes knowingly, who maybe have driven people away who we want to be close and we're wondering what's going on. I pray, Father, that we would confess these things, that we would agree with you that we're wrong, that it's not the right way to live, that it's working against Jesus and against the gospel and not for, that we would have the courage to go and confess to the people, probably beginning with those closest to us, how wrong it is for us to have a spirit of criticism where our ratio is way out of kilter to ask their forgiveness and to humble ourselves by telling them that we want to live a different way. I pray, Father, that we would resolve to live a different way. But resolution is not enough. We need your strength. We want to be strong men and women with soft hearts. And we also want to be full of encouragement, which is the anecdote to criticism. We want to be like Jesus. So I pray that as Pastor Dan prays, we listen and that you change us, that we live differently in Jesus' name. Oh God, as we prayed, we need you. As David quoted, Lord, you know us full well, meaning you know our propensities. You know, even as I talk today, Lord, we're we're not always um, clean and loving and uh, righteous. So I I do pray, as I pray for myself, for our friends, for those even online who are realizing some of us, the most of us have this bent of criticism that you would, first of all, help us to identify that as Pastor Rick prayed to now ask that you would um, fill us with your spirit, Lord, To, to capture that thought because our words come out after a thought is usually in our head. So help us to capture those thoughts and to set them aside they don't please you and to replace them lord with what we see what we hear what we sense which are those words encouragement lord that you would help us put courage into people let us see the opportunities that we've missed i know i still miss them day in and day out would you renew our minds so that as you reminded us when you looked at the crowd you saw the people you had compassion and lord those are the people that come before us, our spouses, our kids, our neighbors, our community, those we work with. Lord, help us to have eyes, your eyes. And Lord, give us your words to put courage in the life of people for your namesake. In Jesus' name we pray.